Hello, welcome to Shalom World's Words of Wisdom series. My name is Peter Van Kampen, and I'm a youth ministry coordinator in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta. Today, I want to talk about Paul. Now, you probably already know overall the story of St. Paul, right? You know that his name was Saul. You know that he persecuted the Christians. You know that he had a powerful conversion experience and he fell off his horse. And you know that God changed his name from Saul to Paul, except that some of those details are not 100% accurate. First of all, the horse. There is no mention of the horse in the Bible, but the horse makes it into several paintings. Caravaggio's painting of the conversion of Paul, and you see this horse, it's right in the middle of the painting, so people always imagine the horse, so that's okay. You can believe in the horse if you want to. But the piece I wanted to talk about was his name. His name was Saul, and it got changed to Paul. And people often assume that God changed his name because God changed Peter's name, right? Peter was Simon, and God called him Peter, because Peter means rock, and on this rock I will build my church, right? God changed Abraham's name. It was Abram. God changed it to Abraham, father of many nations. So people go, okay, there's a thing here. God changes people's names when he gives them a particular mission, and that's true. But it's also a thing that people would go by different names in different cultures, and that seems to be the case with Paul, all right? He was Saul, because that was a Hebrew name, but when he was in Roman or Greek places, he went by Paul. And this isn't uncommon, right? You think about Mark. He was John when he was with Hebrews. He was Mark when he was with the Romans. Peter was actually Cephas when he was with Hebrews, but then he's Peter when he's with Greeks or Romans. You know, Daniel was Belteshazzar. And this is even something that would still happen today, right? If someone from China was called Shang-Chi and they moved to the United States, they might go by Sean instead of Shang-Chi. <laughs> but I think Saul, the name Saul, is actually significant for the character of who Paul was. Paul will tell you that he was a Benjaminite, all right? Well, the tribe of Benjamin was one of the, the many, the 12 tribes of Israel, and it was right next to Judah when they divided up the land. Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, is where King Saul, the first king of the Jews, came from. So it's likely that Saul, whose name is Paul, that Paul was named after King Saul. It's likely that that's why he's called that. But this is kind of interesting because King Saul is famous for losing his anointing and persecuting the anointed one who is King David, whereas Paul in the New Testament is famous for persecuting the followers of the anointed one, the followers of the Messiah persecuting Christ. This parallelism is frequent in scripture, and I don't think it's by accident. It's, it's, you know, scripture was written by God, history was written by God, and these parallels are something that help us get insight into what is actually happening. It's like, for instance, if you watch movies from the Marvel Universe. I, I like those movies. <laughs> I used to watch them kind of haphazardly with my older kids, right? You just, oh, I'll watch this one, I'll watch this one, I'll watch this one. And then one day I watched Infinity War and I watched it. And if you've seen it, I, I watched it and I went, wait, I, I don't understand half of what's going on in this movie. Why not? Because I hadn't watched all the previous ones. See, Infinity War was tying together all these loose ends from other ones. And I said, I need to watch all these other ones so I can understand what happened in this one. That's what's going on in the Bible. That's what's happening in the New Testament. Everything that happens in the New Testament is fulfilling things that happened in the Old Testament. So as you study your scripture, you've got to read the Old and the New. I think the fact that Paul's name is Saul is significant for that reason. Paul 
Paul's appearance. We don't really know what Paul looks like from scripture, but we do know about Paul that he would say things like that, you know, I'm not impressive when you see me in person, but then I write these weighty letters, you know, because he was always scolding people in the letters. And, and you got to wonder, was he kind of this little guy? Was he, you know, sometimes in movies, you'll see Paul featured as kind of like this little guy hunched over, bald, not that attractive. And maybe they're just going with that axe of Paul. Who knows what he physically looked like? But he seemed like the kind of guy who was not afraid of conflict. So in his letters, when he's, he's being bold and putting people in their place, it seems like he was like that in person as well. We know that Paul was a tent maker. We know he was from Tarsus. Now that makes sense. Tarsus was a place where they would make this kind of material out of the wool of, of these black goats. And so that would make good material for making tents. So he's a tent maker from Tarsus. But Tarsus was also a major intellectual capital in the Roman Empire. There's kind of Athens, Alexandria, Tarsus. Tarsus was in what is today modern day Turkey. So he comes from this intellectual center. And in fact, Tarsus was such an important place place that if you were born there, even if you were Jewish, a Jew born in Tarsus would be considered a Roman citizen, which means you have all the rights. Well, that's the case for Paul. Paul is a Roman citizen, and that's going to matter to him later. He's going to end up, so he's born in Tarsus, intellectual center, but for a while he studies under a guy called Gamaliel in Jerusalem. Now that is also a big deal. Gamaliel was one of the leading intellects of the time. All right, if you read non-canonical sources, you're going to see that he was so respected amongst the Pharisees, amongst the academics. It's like when Paul says, oh, and I studied under Gamaliel, that would be like the contemporary saying, oh, I studied at Yale or I studied at Harvard. You would understand, hey, if you studied under Gamaliel, this is the guy. There was a whole intellectual school called the, of uh, Hillel, and Hillel was Gamaliel's grandfather. In fact, Gamaliel, is said to have been the Nazi of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the teaching body of the Jews, all right? They're the ones that Jesus said, you know, don't do what they do, but you have to obey them because they sit on the seat of Moses. The Sanhedrin met in this room just outside the temple. It was like built into the temple wall called the Hall of Unhewn Stones. And they would sit in this U shape and they would all gather and then there'd be a guy who would kind of face them and talk to the 70 judges and he would lead them. That was Gamaliel's role. And in fact, his son inherits that role. So that's how important Gamaliel is as an intellect and as a leader in Jerusalem. And that's who Paul studies under. So the first time we meet Paul is actually at the trial of Stephen. And here's what happened. The, the Christian apostles kept getting dragged before this council in that hall of unhewn stones. And they kept saying, what are we going to do with these guys? What should we do? And it's Gamaliel who says, listen, leave them alone. If what they're doing is not of God, it's going to fade out like Judas of Galilee's movement that was during the census, right? That movement faded out. So this movement is just going to fade out. We don't need to worry about this one. But if it is of God, then we will find ourselves fighting against God. So don't do anything. Well, then immediately after that happens, the people from the, the synagogue in Jerusalem, they drag in Stephen. Stephen is one of the seven deacons who were appointed to help the apostles. Stephen's dragged in there because he's been preaching in the synagogue and the synagogue is upset about this. And they're like, oh, he's blaspheming, he's blaspheming. They bring Stephen before this council and Stephen, they, you know, I think the council is trying to respect Amaliel's wishes. Okay, we're going to hear what he has to say because Stephen goes into this long sermon where he goes, goes into the Old Testament and he explains everything, kind of gives his position. But then it says that they gritted their teeth at him. So I just imagine this kind of U-shaped assembly of high intellectuals, the leaders in Jerusalem, they're sitting there going, oh man, this guy, what's he saying? This is not, a, he's, he's blaspheming the temple. And they're like, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And it seems like they're wrestling with this, trying to follow what Gamaliel said. But then Stephen does something else. He says, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father. And they get so upset. They drag him out. Now, listen, when I pictured this scene before, I imagine it being in, you know, Nowheresville, some dusty road somewhere in Judea. But no, this is right in the temple, right in the hall of, of hewn stones. 
This is right in the temple, right in the Hall of Hewn Stones. They grab Stephen, drag him out, drag him through the temple courtyard. It says they took him out of the city. They would have had to go right through the Golden Gate. They drag him out there and they start stoning him to death. And who's standing there approving of it all? Saul. So this guy, Saul, he's this important figure. He's an intellectual, he's respected, he's young, right? He's not up there with Gamaliel, but he's one of Gamaliel's disciples. And he's there, he's approving of it. And what does he do? He says, yeah, we gotta get these Christians. These guys are a serious problem. They're undermining everything we're trying to do. If you remember in previous videos, we talked about what a Pharisee was. A Pharisee thought what we had to do was purify our society enough that the Messiah could come. Well, the Pharisees were angry with Christ because Christ was coming, claiming to be the Messiah, and then Christ's followers were saying he was the Messiah. And so Paul says, no, we got to do something about these guys. And so what does he do? He gets orders from the Sanhedrin and he rides out and he's going to start persecuting Christians. He's going to start arresting them, throwing them in jail. Maybe the Christians are going to be stoned to death. Christians start scattering from Jerusalem because of the persecution that's going on there. He's on his way to Damascus and that's where he encounters Christ. And when he encounters Christ, Christ says, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul has his famous conversion experience. And again, you probably know the story from here. You know how he goes off and he starts evangelizing all over the place. It's interesting actually, first he goes to Damascus and that's where he completes his conversion and he's prayed over, he's healed. And so he starts preaching in the synagogue there and they're saying, wait, <laughs> Isn't this the guy who came here to arrest us? Now he's preaching about Jesus in the synagogue. He goes back to Jerusalem, starts preaching there, and people start saying, we want to kill this guy. Like this guy is now going against the thing that we actually appointed him to do. We got to kill this guy. We got to get, and so what do they do? They ship him off to Tarsus. They say, let's get him out of here before people kill him, and they send him to Tarsus. But this is interesting. He stays in Tarsus for four years. For four years, he's in that intellectual center, and what is he doing? Apparently nothing. I think what's going on is this. Remember earlier I talked about the importance of reading the Old Testament and seeing how it's fulfilled in the New Testament? I think that's what Paul is doing, okay? Of course, back then, they didn't call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was just the Scriptures. I think Paul was going through the Scriptures, and imagine his excitement when he sees, hey, here in Isaiah, it's talking about this, Jesus fulfills that. Hey, here in Daniel, it's Jesus fulfills that. Hey, here in Ezekiel, Jesus fulfills that. And he's just seeing all these ways in which Jesus fulfills all the scriptures and the entire history of the Jewish people. I imagine he would have been super excited by this. I wish we knew exactly the discoveries that he made and that he had shared those things with us. Eventually, he does start traveling and preaching. He starts traveling with Barnabas, and Barnabas is the one who kind of brought him to the disciples in the first place. He starts traveling around, and he starts going to the Gentiles, and he becomes what is known as the Apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, he starts off kind of in Turkey. They have the Council of Jerusalem where they talk about circumcision, and do we have to circumcise these guys? Uh, and then he goes off, and he goes into Greece. He goes eventually to Rome. And this is why Paul has written so many books in the New Testament. Right? If you ever see the letters of Paul, they're organized in order of longest to shortest. Romans, Corinthians, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. And these are all letters that he wrote to various communities and a few individuals, Titus and Timothy and Philemon. He writes these letters to all these communities and individuals where he's instructing them in the faith. And there is obviously, since he wrote so many books in the New Testament, there are a lot of themes that we could draw out of Paul. But here's the major theme that I want to talk about that you see in Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. He was righteous. See, in previous talks, we talked about Matthew, the tax collector. We talked about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, who was a prostitute, maybe, okay? She was thought to be a prostitute and a sinful woman. We talked about Peter, this uneducated fisher. All these people who had nothing going for them. And Paul had everything going for him. He was born in an intellectual center. He's a Roman citizen. He trains under Gamaliel and he was righteous. He was a Pharisee and he did everything right. He washed his hands the right way. 
every time. He never even touched pork. He never touched the body of a dead thing, right? He was so righteous. He was so pure. But he's going to say, I count it all as rubbish. You will see this theme of faith and works developed throughout Paul's letters. And sometimes Paul can be misunderstood, right? Paul can be misunderstood as saying that we don't need to do anything in order to be saved. That's, that's not what he's trying to say. What he's trying to say is that we can't earn our salvation through good works, which is basically what the Pharisees thought, right? It's not about being circumcised. He's going to talk a lot about that. It's not about this kind of ritual purity. He's going to talk about that thing. But it doesn't mean that we don't, we don't behave well. There's been a couple of errors throughout church history. There was a heresy called Pelagianism. And Pelagianists thought that you could actually earn salvation. Well, that's not what Catholics teach. And it's not what Paul taught, right? Catholics teach that, no, we get salvation by grace. It's a free gift from God. We respond to it in faith, which is manifest through works, right? It's like St. James said, faith without works is dead. Well, this is the teaching of Paul as well. Paul's going to talk about how, you know, we need to push on towards the goal, towards the prize, so that he says that, so that I myself do not lose the crown. So he understood that he has to work. There is some striving that's involved in this. I like to explain it by the analogy of marriage. Marriage is the most common analogy in scripture to explain our relationship to God, right? Sometimes people will go with a, a courtroom analogy, like God is a judge trying to decide if we deserve to get into heaven and then, and then Christ pays the price. And, and that's present in scripture, right? Sometimes people talk about slaves being adopted as children. That is present in scripture, um, but the most common one, and the one I like for this one that helps me understand it the best, is marriage. When I wanted to marry my wife, my wife's name is Catherine, when I wanted to marry her, what I did is I went to her and to propose to her, I said this, Catherine, I deserve to marry you. You ought to be my wife. You know why? Because I got you flowers. I remembered your anniversary. I did this. I did that. I'm such a great guy. You must marry me because I've earned you. Shockingly, she said no. And so I was distressed. I said, well, what's happening? I deserve it, right? Do I not deserve this relation? How, how can I understand this? And I went to my friend David. I said, David, what am I supposed to do? I, I, I deserve this relationship with my wife and she, she, with, with Catherine. And she said no to me. David said, you can't deserve it. You can't earn it. If she's going to be in a marriage with you, it's just going to be because she loves you. She's going to do it just out of love. I'm like, oh, I misunderstood. And so I went back and I properly proposed to Catherine. I got down on one knee. I said, Catherine, will you marry me? And she said, yes. And so we were married. But then in our marriage, what happened? I thought, well, um, I didn't buy her flowers. I didn't remember her anniversary. I didn't treat her with honor. And one day she sat me down. And she said, Peter, what's going on? How come you're not treating me well? Like you, we said we were going to be married. I said, whoa, 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 Catherine. <laughs> when you agreed to marry me, what you said is that you were going to love me. It's a free gift. I can't earn your love. Therefore, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> well, that night I was sleeping on David's couch and I had this chat with him and he said, Peter, you missed it again. Okay, listen, this isn't true. <laughs> I didn't actually have all these encounters with my wife. I proposed to her properly the first time. I remember our anniversary, all those things, right? I, but there, our relationship with God is like that relationship with a spouse. I can't earn my relationship with my wife. Well, I can't earn a relationship with God either. When we talk about heaven, when we talk about salvation, what we're ultimately talking about is a relationship with God forever. You can't earn that. It doesn't make sense. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to act in a way that is loving. By being in a relationship, by agreeing to marry my wife, what I said is, I will love and honor you till death do us part. That's what we're in for when we get into this relationship with God. And that is the message that is in Paul's letters. See, Paul, before that, as a Pharisee, he thought, I just have to be good enough. If I'm good enough, if we're all good enough, we'll all be saved. That's what we have to do. And then he was. He had so much credit. He had his intellectual. He had his purity. He had everything. And he said, look, it's rubbish. It's rubbish. And actually, it seems like Paul still struggled with sin. There's a great quote from Paul when he was writing to the Romans. It says this, what a wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of death? Praised be to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul understood that on his own, 
he could not be righteous. He was still trapped in this body of death. Unlike those other people, like Mary Magdalene, who thought, oh, I'm such a sinner, and, and then Jesus had to call her by name, or Matthew, who's like, well, I'm gonna be excluded from society. Unlike those other disciples, Paul was a guy who thought he could rely on his righteousness. He thought he had the credit, but at the end of the day, he realized that our relationship with God is a free gift, a gift of grace. And he needed to be open to receiving that grace. My challenge to you would be to go to God with that same openness and just let God love you as a free gift. God bless you. Are you searching for fulfillment?